interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to episode 80 of Vikings Uncensored. And as you saw in the uh, at the end of the roll in there, uh, once again, we have to say goodbye to uh, one of the old school Vikings players. Uh, Frank Uso passed away last Sunday. Um, of course, if you remember, we did a right up on him here not too long ago in Brunswick's best, but uh, we wanted to offer up our condolences to the Uso family and all of his friends and, you know, may he rest in peace. Uh, not, another of the, uh, the OGs, so to speak, gone, unfortunately. Um, got a lot to talk about this week, uh, a few news items and stuff, but before we start, Want to plug the new merch we have here. Check it out, ladies and gentlemen. Vikings Uncensored t-shirts. I would have one on right now, but mine does not fit. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a limited supply of them right now on a first run. So if anybody is interested, uh, shoot us a message and uh, we can work something out to maybe get you a t-shirt. High quality, by the way. They are very nice. Yeah, they turned out to be polyester. I'm not sure, but it's it's pretty nice. Turned out pretty good for the uh, our first attempt at merchandising, anyway. So, um, but anyway, enough of the shameless plug. We'll uh, we'll get rolling here because we've got a bunch to talk about. So, um, in uh, NFL type news, uh, big one this week, of course, the Panthers on Monday fired head coach Matt Rule. Oh, you don't say. Yeah, I don't. That just kind of came out of nowhere with that. Yeah, one. I'm surprised, don't you know? Uh, also along with Rule went defensive coordinator Phil Snow and special teams coordinator Ed Foley. Mm. Um, Steve Wilkes, former coach of Wilkos? the... Not Steve Wilkos, Steve Wilkes. Oh, okay, okay. Former head coach of the Arizona Cardinals um, was named the interim coach. Now, rumors are that, of course, they're going to be hot and heavy after Sean Payton, but, uh, you know, we'll, that, that won't happen until after the end of the year, so we won't worry about that. And now. that won't happen unless Sean Payton wants to happen, for sure. Right. Um, although, if you're Matt Rule, getting fired is not the worst thing in the world. I think for the next 48 months, he makes yeah. something, something dollars every month, dude. Yeah, it was like four hundred eighty-five thousand dollars a month for the next no, eight hundred, eight hundred thousand a month. Thousand. Yeah, must be rough. Regardless, yeah, it's a it's a hell of a lot of money. Shit. I mean, hey, compared to a normal human being, on the yeah, he's gonna, he'll make more in a month than most of us are going to make in the ten, next ten years. You know, but uh, can't count on those college coaches, man. No, and that's the thing of the own. He will. Uh, likely have his choice of major college programs that have coaching openings, you know, come next year. He was a very good college coach. He just right. it doesn't translate over to the pros very well. Time um, time again. Mm -hmm. Then in other news, of course, if you watch the end of the Monday night football game between the Kansas city chiefs and Las Vegas Raiders, 
excellent game. With some very piss poor officiating again. That was kind of the theme from the weekend. Um, yeah. But uh, wide receiver Devonte Adams shoved an equipment person on his way into the locker room and the guy went down. Um, now that has turned into him having to go to the hospital with non-life-threatening injuries and uh, has now filed an assault oh my. against and, and police report filed against Devonte Adams. Now, I'm not sticking up for Devonte Adams here. Should he have done what he did? Absolutely not. Sure. But you know what? This, this guy is obviously looking for a payday. I mean, we've all I, played sports, Rhino. And you go and you lose a game like that, the last thing you want is somebody in your face. Right. But I mean, I fell harder going up the stairs this afternoon when I stubbed my foot on the on the carpet than that guy did when he went down. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but he's gonna get a few hundred thousand dollars for his troubles, I'm sure, out of it. Go go hang on that rule. Yeah. That rule's place. Uh, but, uh, you know, of course, and I don't remember if we mentioned this last week, but the uh, from a couple of weeks ago, that streaker during the uh, Rams game that Bobby Wagner unceremoniously tackled and dumped out there is also filing an assault charge against uh, Wagner's, too. So I, I kind of thought that might happen when I seen that. But yeah, that if any normal judge should see that and throw that right out of court right away, right. because that that guy should not have been on the field. He was illegally out there to begin with, and he deserved to get his ass handed to him. He should have got hit harder, in my opinion. Yeah. Now, the equipment guy, he was doing his job, and then this, that, and everything else. So he sh- he was – well, it wasn't like he wasn't where he was supposed to. There was some, you know, other extern- circumstances. Mm-hmm. But it just, you know, shows that the society we live in nowadays that everybody's so happy trying to find a quick buck, it seems like, so – but uh, we won't get into that any deeper than that, just because it's a rabbit hole that we don't need to dive down into head first right now. A um, couple of quick Vikings notes uh, from last week. Uh, cornerback a Caleb Evans still in concussion protocol. Uh, you got con- slightly concussed on that onside kick that he mm-hmm. recovered. And uh, Ty Chandler broke his thumb on special teams and went on IR earlier this week. So he is out a minimum of four weeks. Rookie class is made of glass. Yeah, pretty much. Um, So with that, we signed defensive back Theo Jackson off of the Tennessee Titans practice squad now. I don't know Theo Jackson from Reggie Jackson or uh, Jermaine Jackson or uh, Latoya Jackson, whatever, but you know, what's that? Tito Jackson. Tito. Yeah. Um, (laughs) But uh, apparently we had, we signed him to the active roster for whatever reason, but yeah. Yeah. Come join the party. I guess so. Um, but with that, we're, we'll roll into a recap of uh, last week's win versus the Chicago Bears, uh, a game that ended up being yeah. a hell of a lot closer than it really should have been and what everybody thought it was going to be as it started. I'm going to make this way harder than it needs to be. It was a learning experience, to say the least. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, in the first half, the offense was almost perfect. Yeah, Okada was put on a play calling clinic for sure there. Mm-hmm. Well, and I mean, you look at the, uh, you know, just the numbers. Uh, of course, the big one in the first half, Kirk Cousins started off 17 for 17. Man. Not only, Beautiful. not only beating his personal best uh, previously, I think it was he was 13 for 13 when he yep. still played for the commanders in a game, but uh, also setting the Vikings all time record, surpassing 16 straight by Tommy Kramer set back in 1979. Good job, Kirk. Yeah. He, uh, 
I mean, he was hitting every, everything that uh, he was throwing. It was, it was awesome to watch. I mean, he was, it was, and he made it look so effortless. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the day he ended up 32 of 41 for 296 yards, one touchdown and one interception. Um, now I, you heard a bunch of stuff, people bitching about that interception because he had CJ ham open in the flat. Okay. I, I'm just going to say, it, man. I'm just going to say this right now. Last year, everybody would have bitched their ass off if he would have thrown it to CJ ham in the yeah, flat. We true. wanted Kirk to take more chances and we knew that he was going to throw more interceptions because of it. This wasn't really a bad pass by Kirk. It was a hell of a play by the defensive back. Uh, was it, Kendall Vidor or whatever his name is. Yeah. 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 He, he, I mean, he jumped the route. It was a great play by the defender. It wasn't a bad throw by Kirk. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to fault Kirk for that one. Kirk has been putting up Kirk stats, but you know what? He's winning. And that's what matters. The godly stats that he has in the past, but you know what? These are winning. He's winning games Mm -hmm. and he's, He's right up there, high percentages of because of him winning these games. Right. Well, and and here again for the third week in a row, Cousins leads a game-winning drive at the end of the game, and this one he capped it off himself, run or you know on a quarterback sneak running it in from a yard out. This is the version of Kirk Cousins I want mm-hmm. on my team. And uh, I know Kirk had mentioned this week in his press conference on Wednesday that. You know, he had a couple of decent plays where he took off and ran this last week. He said he wants to do more of that. He doesn't want to overdo it, but he, you know, take advantage of situations when they arise like there. that. And I'm all for that as well. well I mean, and he looked slick doing it on that when he took off that time. He actually had to have some good pocket awareness there to figure out how to get out of the pocket. Like yeah. He did. And he didn't look like a newborn Colt trying to uh, run either. He actually was. Fairly nimble on his feet for that one. So, yep. Um, but anyway, uh, beyond Kirk, uh, Justin Jefferson putting on another clinic this past week. Uh, 12 receptions for 154 yards. He had a pass for 20, or threw a pass for 23 yards. Creative. And also the, uh, had the two point conversion at the end of the game that, uh, Kind of help seal the deal. This is was his sixth career 150 yard game. Insane. Tying him with Randy Moss and Lance Elworth for the most by a wide receiver in their first three seasons. Insane in the membrane. And he and Jefferson still has two thirds of this season to go yet. So he, you know, very likely will. Sky's the limit, man. Has a very good chance of breaking that. Um, he also moved into second all t- for 100-yard receiving games in the first three years, uh, two behind Randy Moss and, I believe, Odell Beckham Jr. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised to see this kid hit a 200-yard game this season he's against been, someone. I wouldn't be surprised either. I mean, he's uh, – Dude's on fire. Mm-hmm. And he's being schemed open. I mean, a lot of the catches he's had this year, he's got – Four yards of, you know, cushion between him and the nearest defender. Yeah, and that that happened a lot this week. Um, Beyond that, uh, Dalvin Cook, pretty decent day. Uh, 18 carries, 94 yards and two touchdowns, uh, 5.4 yard per carry average. I like it. I'll take that any day for, you know. Especially in this offense, that's what you want to get back is the numbers like that. Especially and when you've got a wide receiver putting up the numbers that Jefferson did and uh, Cook putting up, you know, give or take a little bit around 100 yards and a touchdown and, or two, I'll take that. And he's any spreading day. the ball around. I mean, it's not just Jefferson getting the ball. He's KJ had a good, I think, four or five receptions last yeah, game. Yeah, so did Thielen. Thielen had three or four. Uh, then another one that uh, I was just going to bring up here. Uh, we were real hard on this guy starting the season for a good reason, but uh, – Irv Smith is continuing his uh, return to form, I guess we will call it. Had four catches for 42 yards, 
Big time and, this week. And that one was a really nice catch going across the middle where he kind of fingertipped snagged it and brought it, it in. Dude. He just snagged it. Just pop. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful. It was. Yeah, and that was a critical play. It got us a first down and we kept kept the ball moving. Yeah. Um, the offensive line, for the most part, did a pretty good job. Uh, O'Neal did give up a, a sack. Uh, but Christian Derrissaw now is now the third highest rated tackle in the NFL per, per, per PFF as of this Perf week. Perf 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 per PIF. Per PIF. <laughs> He's perfectly the perfect of his heart. Uh, but uh, love it. Yeah, I, I mean, we got I, we got something good in Darisaw here. I'm. It's uh, and he's he's still getting better. I mean, he hasn't reached the ceiling yet. Yep. Um, but on the offense thing, of course, you know, for as great as it was the first half, we kind of went into conservative mode that second half and didn't really do a whole lot until uh, we needed to again in the fourth quarter. Um, you know, now this turning it off and turning it on thing. It's not, almost like a switch, it seems like. Literally. It is, but, you know, we, we, we're not going to always be able to do that. So, you know, it, that's, right. I guess, it's kind of ticky-tack, but it's the one gripe I have. That can hurt you really bad. We, you know, yeah. we just need to keep piling it on and not worry about hurting anybody's feelings by running yep. up. So we take that only. switch up to on position. Yeah. Um, but kind of some statistical numbers here uh, the over the last three weeks the offense ranks number one in the league in success rate percentage um, and by success rate percentage it means gaining at least 40 percent of the yards you need to go on first down getting at least 60 percent of it through second down and of course getting the full 100 100 percent on third and fourth down. So there's definitely some really good sexy numbers out there for this offense. Honestly, I've seen a lot of them in the last couple of weeks anyways. Yep. And like we said, we haven't played a complete game on offense yet. We do right. in this. I mean, this offense is going to be special. I mean, it's already very good. And I believe the same can be said for the defense too, but it might just, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that that's a good segue. We'll, we'll roll over to the defensive side of things here now. Um, again, we're playing that uh, bend, but bend, but bend, and hopefully we don't break kind of uh, glorified prevent. I've been calling it the Minnesota nice defense here for the last era. Oh, that's spot on, dude. That's good. Yeah, that's it's, good. Uh, you know, Donatel is, seems extremely passive in his play calling. He did. He was a little bit more aggressive this week, but he wasn't getting aggressive until it, until he had to become aggressive. Yeah. Well, I mean, in the first half, we held, had them pretty much dead to rights the whole time, and then the second half, we made Justin Fields look like a competent quarterback. Yep. Yep. Um, but against the run, one thing we have been harping on, and I've been as critical about this as anything, but uh, we held a a very good Bears run offense. I believe they were number four in the league going in to 78 yards on 24 carries. That's a 3.3 yard per carry clip. It's coming around. That that run defense is coming around. Yeah, the last three weeks and we've we've gone against uh, pretty good run teams. Detroit was top two or three, I believe, when we played them. Of course, I remember the Bears were fourth. Uh, We've held opponents to 328 total yards on the ground and on 86 carries, which is 3.8 yards per carry. So over the last three weeks, we're giving up roughly 100 yards on the ground. Less than four yards a carry. That's, I mean, what more can you ask for? I yeah. Mean, I mean, there, there's still plenty of room for improvement, but that's absolutely it's trending in the right direction. And that's, yes. and that's the biggest thing. You know, we got to remember again, you know, as much as we've been griping about some of this is, we all knew going into this season, there was going to be a, some growing pains. There was going to be a learning curve. But you know what? Well, we're ending up on the right side of these growing pains, which is excellent, is, which you should be positive about. You should feel positive right. about that. And Harrison Smith actually made that comment in an interview post-game or sometime earlier in the week. while you're still learning is a great yep. thing. Yep. 
that's a thing. So, uh, you know, and they're, you're starting to hear more and more of the, of the guys talking about, you know, Dalvin Cook came out this week in an interview. Uh, he was on one of the sports stations, ESPN or wherever it was, but um, talking about just the, like, again, the whole difference in the culture and that kind of stuff. And they didn't, you know, seeing what Kevin O'Connell does, and we've seen some of this in the poet in the locker room speeches and stuff after the game, how fired up he is, how engaged he is with everybody. Cook made a comment that, you know, they never even really knew what Zimmer was thinking unless he was bitching at him because they didn't have those meetings with him and they weren't doing that kind of stuff. And it it got ugly, man. We all know this. I'm I'm so glad that that is over. Yep. Um, but anyway, looking more on the defense, uh, Cam Dantzler led the team in tackles and uh, had the play of the game to seal it at the very end there where uh, he actually got awesome. burned initially by uh, our old buddy Amir smith Marset, but uh, Dantzler was didn't able give up on the play, did not give up on the play, got up there and was able to rip the ball away from him. Fields underneath, he finds the former Viking Amir Smith Marset, and it's stripped away by Dantzler. He takes it down into Bears territory. A huge turnover with a minute to go. And uh, turn around, literally to, rip it. Yeah, off, literally like, ripped it right it. out of his arms, and uh, was able to, and had the wherewithal after that to go down. You know, not try to take off and run and risk turning the ball no, back no, over or anything he like that. Sets his game to him and he's like, yeah, no. he, he kind of got into the clear a little bit and then down he went, you know, so, but uh, don't follow up a stupid play with your own stupid play, mm-hmm. which was excellent. He did not do it. And I was happy. <laughs> yep. And uh, speaking of the PFF rankings, uh, they currently have Dantzler as the 15th best cornerback in the league. I love it. And he's still improving and he developing. is, he is. And one thing I saw this week, which I like to see, uh, Patrick Peterson, I, I don't know if it was on his podcast or whatever, said that he's actually got Dan, he, he and Dantzler are sitting two nights a week doing film study and things like that. So the, uh, the mentorship of Cam Dantzler by Patrick Peterson is starting to pay some dividends the way it's looking. I mean, he's, yeah. I mean, we've always knew Dantzler was talented, but he's been up, he's been down, he's been up, he's been down and that, you know, a couple of weeks ago, they talked to Peterson about that. And, you know, he, he said he wants Dantzler to be great. He knows he can be great and he's going to do everything in his exactly. power to for help him get there. For Peterson to take that role, I believe says a lot about his character, mm-hmm. but also the fact, I think it goes a long way that this coaching staff did challenge his status as the number one corner. You know, that helps a lot, too, because then he's like, okay, I know I'm the guy. I don't have to worry about losing my spot. And then it makes it easier for him to mentor these younger guys as well, yep. I believe. So that's a direction to look at it anyways, too. A mm-hmm. um, couple other quick hits on the defense. Uh, Daniil Hunter had a sack and two tackles for losses. Um, he's been kind of invisible for a lot of the earliest part of the season. Season is young. Yeah. He'll get now, but now He'll it seems one thing I noticed, and I know we were talking about this in our Gallerhorn group on Wednesday. It seems like they're dropping Hunter off and coverage oh God, a don't. lot more than they're. Yeah. Which, that's, that's not something you want. That's not something I like to see anyways. No, Hunter is a pass rush specialist. You don't need him out there, you know, covering tight ends. No. Um, otherwise, uh, Zadaria Smith and DJ Wanham each had a half a sack. We did force three fumbles. Uh, the The only one we recovered was that Dantzler one. Um, otherwise, they they got back on the other ones. Yep. Uh, biggest thing, like like I mentioned earlier, we let Justin Fields get comfortable in that third quarter, and I think he was eleven for thirteen at one point in time in the second half. Now he was like three for three for twelve in the first half. You could tell coming out that second half that Chicago was playing desperate, you know, like a desperate team would play. Yeah. And, uh, and we, you know, let them take us for a ride there for a little bit. Well, they got some uh, momentum after that ungodly catch that Darnell. That was amazing. 
that was mean, a that, great there, there was nothing that could be done about that. That was probably the best catch I've seen all year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely highlight real type stuff. Uh, you just got to tip your hat to the guy on a play like that because that there's type not of much you can do about it. That type of play, like you said, momentum. Mm -hmm. um, will just fire up a team. And then the next thing you know, you're rattling off two, three good series. Yeah. So um, special teams had a little bit of a rough week. Uh, of course, uh, Greg Joseph couldn't hit water if he fell out of a boat this week. And uh, then, of course, Ryan Wright had that one awful shank of a punk that uh, got a had a there was a penalty in the process. I think we netted five yards on the damn punt. Uh, it's uncharacteristic, but uh, it happens to a punter. From yeah, time to time. and that was all in part of this spot where Chicago was getting the momentum and, and that yep. situation helped them, didn't help us at There's all. Times either. like that in years past where, you know, the, the proverbial roof would just collapse and we would yep. just be, we would just let the team run over us then and just give up. Yeah. I mean, it was bad enough. We let them, we let Chicago scored 19 unanswered points, you know, and after being down 21 to three, they went up 22 to 21 on us, but there again, to the team's credit, they didn't roll over and play dead. They uh, went down that final drive, scored the touchdown, put the game away, and we moved on to uh, still only having one loss in the season. Uh, one thing I will say is, is this team knows who they are. You know, they know that they are still going to get better, that the, that the, the, the ceiling is still there and it's still higher. Um, and they're not complacent about that four and one record. Mm -hmm. They know that, you know, these games have been close and they came away with a couple of squeakers and uh, they're, they know they're a team that's still learning and that we can be much better, even though our record says that we're at four and one, there's room for improvement. Oh, most definitely. And uh, with that four and one record, Kevin O'Connell moves into ninth all time for Vikings head coaching victories only took him five games to pass Les Steckel. I like me some Kevin O'Connell. I, I do too. I all accounts. Yep. I, he's the, uh, I can't say if I felt the same way about Childers. Um, Zimmer. I liked it. You know, I think most of the fans like Zimmer when he first came here. He first well. got here. Uh, so, I didn't like Childress from the get go. He rubbed me the wrong way from the exactly. first time I first yeah, time I heard his press conference. You know, you, you could tell he was a pompous dick that thought he was smarter than everybody else. KOC had me at hello. You had me at hello. You had me at hello. Yeah. <laughs> he had me at hello. Hi. <laughs> Um, Where you any, at? Where you at? Yeah. <laughs> Anything else uh, you want to hit on the uh, Bears game before we move to the awards? Nope. I think we got her. All right. So with that, we will uh, tie a little bow on that last week's victory with uh, our weekly awards segment. Um, again, we celebrate the good and the not so good. Starting off with the good and what we call our badass of the week award. Who is that guy? Whoever he is, he is one tough badass. Who do you got for your badass this week, Lance? You know, there was a couple of uh, players that were deserving of this this week. Um, you know, Kevin O'Connell, the coach, was obviously deserving. Wade Phillips, a deserving candidate. Wes, Wes, Wes Phillips. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wade, Baum, Wes. Come on. Yeah. All three the same. Wilson. <laughs> Except, you know, Wes is the only one doing offense. Yeah. But anyways, I'm going to go with Kirk. Um, the dude continues to impress me after four years of disappointments. Um, the dude is, is taking strides forward and adding some wrinkles to his game. I love the fact that we're getting Kirk up to the line with like 15 seconds in the play clock. Play clock! The play. So, I'm not going to repeat what you just said. Yeah, I know. I, I totally forgot that I dropped <laughs> the play clock. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I like how they're getting Kirk up to the line with plenty of time left on the play clock to diagnose and giving him the ability to diagnose the defense and switch plays if need be. Mm-hmm. Um, I have never seen Kirk audible or manage the offense like he has in Washington or in his time here in Minnesota up until this year. Um, is that Kirk Manning back there behind the, behind that offensive line? I don't know, but he is making some good calls yeah. when he's up there. And he's making plays. And he's making plays that he wouldn't have made on a regular basis in the past. And he's taking more risks, which, you know, I'm, I'm all for. Take some risks, brother. You do something different. Do something outside of your box. Yeah. And uh, it'll pay off. And it has been. So... Kirk, you rightfully and dutifully so get my badass award this week. Yeah, and same for me. Uh, Kirk's my pick. Now, you know, like you said, there's plenty of players that were deserving Justin Jefferson, of course. Uh, But when you uh, go 17 for 17 to start the game, uh, yeah, you're going to get the badass of the award unless you completely fall apart in the second half. But um, like I said, Kirk, Kirk Tober started out on a pretty good note. So, uh, tempo man as well has been awesome mm-hmm. through all five weeks. You know, I mean, Philly, that was just a forgettable game altogether. Just that was the game that we can just forget about <laughs> For until now. we meet again, my friend. Right. Um, but this tempo of this offense, I love, it reminds me a lot of the, the bills from the nineties. Just a high-paced, up-tempo offense, you know, puts that defense on their heels. And when I'm seeing Kirk doing this, you know, let's get up to the line, let's get up to the line. He gets up there and he's diagnosing and making plays. I love it. I absolutely love it. This is the Kirk that I wanted back in 2018. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so then with that, we will move on to the not so good with what we call our red foreman award of the week. Son, you don't have bad luck. The reason that bad things happen to you is because you're a dumbass. (laughs) And who do you got for that? All right. Well, you can go ahead and start popping some players up here because I got a handful of them. Okay. They all come from the same unit. And now you know what I'm talking about. So please... If you will pop Ryan right up there for me, Greg uh, Joseph, and Jalen Rieger as well. He ain't escaping this either. And you might as well pop up Matt Daniels up there as well. You know, after all the all the hubbub last week about the special teams being so great and taking leaps and bounds forward, they came back down to earth, and they had themselves a dud this week. Um, yeah. All all four of the guys I mentioned are all deserving of that award. So yeah, Ryan Wright, Greg Joseph, Jalen Rieger, Matt Daniels, you guys get my dumbass award this week. Yeah, definitely um, deserving in there for sure. Um, another one you could probably throw in. I know you've, you've given it to this guy a couple of times. Uh, I'm still not letting Donatel off the hook. Uh, the fact that we, uh, you know, like I said, gave up 19 straight points. Deserves to be called out. Now, granted, some of that was due to the special teams and other situations, the great catch by Mooney, things like that. Um, I'm not going to give it, I'm not going to give it to Donatel, but I'm just pointing, not, it, out, okay. pointing it out. Um, I'm, I'm going to give it to, uh, I'm giving it to the special teams in general this week again, too. So basically we can, the same guys you. It doesn't happen too often. That's all good. Yeah. But uh, yeah, because that was, that was the worst game by the special teams we've had this year. So. Yeah. And, and, you know, let's just get better, Mm -hmm. you know, all around in general, special teams, offense, defense, once these, all three phases of this team are bouncing off one of another, it's going to be a wonderful thing to see. Yep. And we haven't, we haven't played a game really where the closest we came probably was the green Bay game to start the uh, season. And we had, you know, you know what though? He's came. O'Connell's had us ready for these divisional games. Mm -hmm. And it's it's, it's good. 
yeah, I mean, we've rolled through the home half the of the, the road, yep, we've rolled through the home half of the divisional game so far and came out three and oh, you can't expect or you can't ask for anything better than that. Um, of course, we did not mention the other great news from, from uh, Sunday when the uh, Green Bay Packers went across the pond and promptly lost to the New York Giants in London. So, gives us a one game cushion or what, a game and a half. But, well, it, Realistically, it's a two-game cushion because right now we own the tiebreaker over them. So, right. Um, don't get complacent, and I don't think this team has that word in their. No, I, I don't think so either. Um, but you know, the next we got the next couple of games, two three games coming up are definitely winnable. You know, and I like that we're winning these close games this early in the season because later on the season you're going to want to know how to win those games, mm-hmm. especially come playoff time. Yep. Um, so, but with that, we're going to roll over into another one. Of, one oh, more thing. One more thing. One more thing. All right. We got to start putting up points in the third quarter. Oh, absolutely. That's we got to start putting up points in the third quarter. Um, I, I, we're coming out in the second half very slow, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm not liking it. No, that that's one of the biggest things this team needs to work on, other than the defensive stuff that we mentioned. Is every single game this year, the third quarter has been pretty pretty ugly. Yeah. So now we can move on right now. All right. Now we're going to move on to another one of the classic beer commercials. So uh, head on over to the fridge, grab yourself a cold one, crack it open, check this out, and we will be back in a minute. We're not just a couple of animals who can only play football. We can be civilized, too. Tennis is sophisticated, but you still got to be fast on your feet. So we still drink light beer from Miller. It's got a third less calories than the regular beer, and it's less filling. And it really tastes great. Now that we've played singles, we're looking for a nice, friendly game of doubles. Tennis, anyone? Mm-hmm. Light beer from Miller. Everything you always wanted in a beer, and less. All right, we are back. And uh, now we look ahead to this weekend's matchup in sunny south florida versus the miami dolphins um you know this is a game a couple of weeks ago i didn't think we were going to have much chance at all in yeah, play. I'm right on that same ship as you for sure um but with they were the, high. yeah things have happened but with the situations that have uh, occurred the last couple of weeks uh this is a very winnable game and uh, it's like I'm, I'm going to be very disappointed if we do not win this game. Get, uh, attack while they're bleeding, you mm-hmm. know. Yeah, and pretty much is how it goes here. And there's blood in the water in Miami right now. So yeah, that's we, what I'm getting at. We, we definitely got to be sharks this weekend. Yes. Um, but before we get into that, we'll look at Dolphins some of the speed sharks though. Right now, <laughs> depends on the shark. <laughs> really big scary shark jaws is going to kick the shit out of flipper i'm sorry (laughs) um but anyway before we get into you know the stuff here we'll look at the numbers right away which again some of these numbers probably don't mean a whole lot this week with uh the injuries and stuff miami's facing but um offense by the numbers yards per game the vikings are 10th now miami is 16th uh, passing yards, Miami is fifth. The Vikings are eighth. Wow. Uh, rushing, Minnesota is 21st. Miami is 29th. Uh, points per game, we are tied for 12th in the league with Miami. Wow. And uh, turnovers on offense, we are tied for 10th with Miami. So this is a this is a game by the tail of the tape that looks like it's going to be considerably close. Very, I mean, the the numbers would say that anyway. The numbers yeah. would say that, right? But right. We, we have to play the tape, right? So, um, rolling over the defensive side of things, uh, yards per game, Minnesota is twenty fourth, Miami is twenty fifth. Are, are we playing ourselves? It's almost <laughs> starting to look that way. Uh, versus the pass, 
Minnesota 22nd, Miami 28th. Uh, here's probably the biggest discrepancy versus the run. Miami is 13th. The Vikings are 20th. Points allowed. Uh, Minnesota is 14th. Miami is 28th. Uh, now, of course, they did just give for, up 40 points to the New York Jets last weekend. So The Jets are coming together, though. They're yeah, no we pushovers. We, we talked about that. And I love that head coach they got over there. Yep. We talked That's, about that after the draft. I mean, the Jets probably had the best draft of anybody in the league this year. Yeah. And it's starting to show. And they got – Sauce Gardner is for real, fellas. Well, and then they got Brees Hall, who is coming on really, really nice as a running back. Um, and, of course, now they have uh, Captain Cougar himself, uh, Zach Wilson, back at quarterback. So Who will be playing this later on this year? So, yeah. Join us for that one, too, fellas, ladies right. and gents. Um, but then uh, one more on the defensive side of things. Takeaways, Minnesota is tied for 13th. Miami is 29th, so they don't take the ball away a lot. Now, of course, the big news is uh, Miami's quarterback situation uh, came out on Wednesday that seventh-round rookie Skylar Thompson – will get the start against the Vikings on Sunday uh, unless something drastic changes. We need to take advantage of that. Yeah. Now, I'm sick of losing to seventh round un our undrafted quarterbacks, man. Sick of it. It's been going on for far too long. This little, this goes back to, to Tice, to Frazier, to, to, to Dennis I, Green even. Actually. Losing the backup quarterbacks. Actually, I think we against – late round rookie or rookies. I think rookies in general, I think we've won the last six straight against a rookie starting, or, you know, rookie quarterbacks, but this, yeah. Yeah. It's typical, you know, the backup quarterbacks in general, we, we always have a real bad uh, tendency to, to make them look like the second coming of Joe Montana, but, um, but uh, of course, Tua after suffering back to back, weeks of concussions and back injuries. Uh, he has started to throw a little bit as of Wednesday, uh, still very limited. And uh, they uh, already ruled him out as of Wednesday. So uh, he will not play. Teddy Bridgewater, who also suffered a concussion against the Jets last week, has not cleared concussion protocol as of yet. He will be re-evaluated re on Thursday. Um, now Miami has said that uh, he, he will be the backup on Sunday, provided he clears protocol, which this sounds like they assume he will. But uh, they don't feel confident enough in his health to start him apparently. So um, he will be the backup. Uh, other injuries, uh, of course, big names, uh, Tyreek Hill was in a walking boot after the game on Sunday, but, uh, sounds like he plans on playing dolphins had 18 players on their injury list on Wednesday. Uh, some notable names tackle Teron Armstead, of course, Bridgewater, we mentioned, uh, linebacker slash edge rusher, Melvin Ingram. They're one of their big name pass rushers. Uh, running back Raheem Mostert did not participate. Uh, tight end Durham Smith or Smythe did not participate. Out of I've never heard of that guy, so I he's not Mike Gusecki or anything. But um, then a bunch they had uh, a couple of defensive backs that were limited. Uh, they're big. Time defensive back Xavier Howard, who did not play last week, also limited. Uh, you know, he would be the guy that would be covering Jefferson if he plays this weekend. Right. So if he can't go, that bodes That's well big. for us in the offense again. Uh, defensive end Emmanuel Og Ogba, their other starting defensive end, was uh, li limited. Tua, of course, they considered him limited, but we already know he's not going to play. Uh, Tyreek Hill was a 
full participant with a quad foot injury. Uh, safety Brandon Jones with a chest injury was a full participant. Greg Little, who uh, will more than likely line up against Daniil Hunter for most of the game with a hip injury, was a full participant. And their other starting wide receiver, Jalen Waddle, with a groin injury, was a full participant. Mm. So they've yeah. kind of got a walking mash unit going on down there right yeah, they're, now. They're but, banged up a little bit. Um, whereas for the Vikings on the injury report, we had four guys on the uh, report this week, and none of them were named Andrew Booth Jr. So he looks like he's probably on track to play this weekend, barring any setbacks and you know between Wednesday and Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, but injuries for the Vikings, of course, we mentioned before, a Caleb Evans still in concussion protocol. Uh, he was limited. Alexander Madison was limited with a shoulder. Mm. Uh, Zadarius Smith with that knee he's been right. dealing with for a couple of weeks was limited. And uh, Jalen Naylor, who of course missed last week with that hamstring was a full participant. So I expect to see him playing this week. It's going to be nice borrowing, barring anything crazy happening this weekend. This bye week is coming at the right time. And to come out of the bye week with nobody on the injury list would be ideal. Mm -hmm. and just fresh so let's hope we get that yeah um now of course you know we talked about a lot of the big names miami has that are banged up they've still got you know assuming most of those guys play they're a good team yeah you know, they've got you look at the their offensive weapons you've got tyreek hill you've got jalen waddle as the wide receivers i mean Tyreek Hill is probably the fastest player in the league. And he's definitely an elite receiver. Oh, absolutely. He's top two, three receivers in the league, probably. Yeah. Um, and Waddle's no slouch. I mean, he's he's a very good number two wide he's receiver. Growing and he's getting better. So, yeah. Uh, Raheem Mostert is a good running back. I mean, he's given us problems in the past when he uh, played for San Francisco. Jusecki's no pushover either, I tell you. No. Nope. Um, then over on the defensive side, of course, they got uh, Raekwon Davis, his nose tackle. Uh, we mentioned uh, Ogba and Melvin Ingram as at edge rushers, both very good edge rushers. Uh, Ingram, of course, is getting a little bit long in the tooth, but uh, they've also got Jalen Phillips, who uh, Ogba is actually one of their, their defensive tackles. They run and uh, Jalen Phillips is the other edge rusher. And I mean, he's, you know, young guy was highly touted coming out of the draft. It'll be another good test for our offensive line. Mm -hmm. um, then of course, you know, we mentioned Xavier Howard, who's a very good cornerback. Uh, if he plays, makes things a little more difficult. Upper edge on the corners for sure. Yeah, he is. And uh, now if he doesn't play, like I mentioned, that's going to make things a whole lot easier to get, to uh, get our guys open. Uh, they got Brandon Jones, one of their pretty good safety back there as well. So, uh, you know, like we talked about the first, after the first couple of weeks, this was a game I had us penciled down for as a loss. But uh, with the situations as they are, with a rookie seventh round quarterback starting, you know, there's no- We're, we're in Miami too, so- yeah. And, you know, there was, they were talking about this uh, on the radio Wednesday when I was uh, out for lunch, I was listening a little bit. Miami has a problem, kind of the same kind of a problem that uh, Los Angeles has with home team advantage type thing for, for uh, you know, fans in the stands. They're fully expecting it to be in that close to 50, 50 of Vikings fans and Miami I mean, fans, you know, 40, 60 or whatever it ends up being. Vikings fans travel pretty well. Yeah, you know, they do. They really do. And especially at this time of the year, you know, going down to, uh, you know, Miami a warmer place. The they're, they're, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, the, the snowbirds, a lot of them have uh, headed that way already. So uh, expect to see a good showing of Vikings purple in the. And they, uh, they got some groups out there that are 
Florida based Vikings fans groups mm-hmm. that we're part of as well as in Vikings Uncensored. So we yep. know that there's fans down there. Oh, absolutely. Um, but beyond that, um, I guess, what do you want to see and what do you expect here this week? Just more growth in general. Um, more, be, more, you know, becoming a team and things clicking and uh, this defense, you know, taking another step in the right direction. Uh, doing what we should do and shutting down this seventh round quarterback. Take advantage of these players that are on the injured list at the moment and mm-hmm. take advantage of those matchups. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, for me, it's the same thing. The biggest thing, you know, I want, I want to see us start fast. Like we have the last couple of weeks, come back out in the second half, like you mentioned earlier and keep that intensity and keep that tempo going. Don't go to sleep for the third quarter. Like we had going to the bye week at five and one. Yep. And uh, on the defensive side of things, continued improvement there. We, you know, I want to see us start doing more of this complexity, you know, stuff, moving players around, bringing pressure off, you know, make life miserable for this rookie out there in his first NFL start. Knock him on, knock him on the ground. This is the seventh round rookie. Get exotic on this kid. Well, you don't even need to get exotic. Just get pressure in his face, get him flustered, make him make mistakes, knock him on the ground, you know, just, Get him rattled and take care of business. Mm-hmm. You know, this should be a game. You know, we should sack sack this kid three times at least. And we should cause some turnovers on this kid. Yeah. I mean, the throw couple picks. Yeah. Bait him into it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've got wily veterans like Patrick Peterson and Harrison Smith back there that can you know, hold off and that has get the, some tricks up their sleeves, right? Bait this guy into throwing a pass, jump the route, pick it off. Um, you know, Dan, Dancer's fully capable of it. I mean, he's had drops a couple of times when the situations have come, but that doesn't Dancer's mean he can't been, do it. Pulled a couple of Breelands this year. Yeah. But you know what? His overall play is also, you know, kind of erase that off the chalkboard a little bit. Right. Right. So. Um, but here again, you know, across in coming across the middle, perfect opportunity for Kendricks and Hicks to get in there and possibly get a pick or something, you know, it's. And getting some wins on the road is huge this year. Yeah. Um, you know, good. we only have two games out of the next six games that we have at home. So if we win here on the road, it'd be, it would be huge. Yep. Going into the bye. Absolutely. Um, okay. Prediction time. What do you got? And then these close games, I'm going to have to go. Let's go 24 to 20 Vikings. Okay. That you know what? I mean, no. That seventh round rookie quarterback is not putting 20 points up on us. But you know what, McDaniels is a hell of a good is a hell of a good football mind too. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm back and forth on this one. I, I part of me says I want to go 24 to like seven, but the other part of me wants to go 24 to 20, just knowing that McDaniels. Is it no pushover at, you know, he's an offensive genius. So, and Tyreek Hill is probably going to get loose for a play or two. Yeah. I'm just going to say we're going to win this one. I don't know a score in particular, but we'll come away with the win. Somehow, some way, we'll find a way to win again. Yeah. I'm a little leery about putting a point total on this, too. Um, I'm going to keep saying it until we do it. I want to see this team come out and break that 30 point barrier. We got close last week, but we still have not done it yet. Um, the game would be uh, would be great to see. Yep. Now with Miami being 28th against the pass, I think it's a very good opportunity for Justin Jefferson to feast once again this week. Uh, KJ Osborne, Adam Thielen, Irv Smith back and you know getting more involved in this stuff again. So I'm going to say we're I'm going to say we're going to go over 30 this week and we're going to win. Now wh- whether it be 34 24 or whether it be 34 to 12, whatever. This is a prime game for the ESAT nation, regardless. We we if we lose, it's gonna be yeah, we t- we told you so. We lost to a shitty team. It's about time. And if we win, they're gonna be like, Well, 
the only reason we beat him is because they, they all these players are out and aren't playing this this day. So yeah, we're well, pretty much damned if we do and damned if we don't with this one. As far as I'm concerned, ESAT Nation can kiss my fat white ass because uh, <laughs> they're not going to be happy no matter what we do. So word. All right. So uh, yep. But yeah, I'm, I'm like I said, I had I had this pegged as a probable probable loss three weeks ago, but as of today, with the circumstances and how they are. Yep. I'm going to be disappointed if we don't win this game and win it hopefully fairly comfortably. But um, with that, we have reached once again, the best segment of the show as uh, Lance takes a look at the players to wear number 80 for the Minnesota Vikings in this week's edition of Brunswick's best. So lay that beautiful list on us there, Mr. Brunswick. Today's list is uh is it very big? I do got one audible mention here. Uh, Terry LeCount played receiver for for us. Wore the number eighty before Carter, obviously. Um, from uh seventy eight to eighty seven. Terry, you get an honorable mention this week, buddy. All right, so number eighty. You know, you think of Vikings, you think of number eighty. There's really only one name that comes to mind, and this 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 number is obviously been retired since this player has retired um and bill waddy right <laughs> yeah you're right no <laughs> but this player is none other than the the great chris carter now uh chris was the, the reason i really fell in love with the vikings um he's kind of what drew me in and uh was really it was easy for me to be infatuated with the guy with the types of catches he would make along the sideline and just you know all the, all, all the dude did was catch touchdowns so um anyways i got a little bit of a write-up here and uh well, well it's a little bit of a longer one this week so we'll dig we'll dive deep into uh, chris carter chris carter played college football at the ohio state university and was drafted by the Eagles in the fourth round of the 1987 NFL Supplemental Draft. Now, while in Philadelphia, head coach Buddy Ryan helped to coin one of ESPN's Chris Berman's famous quotes about Carter. All he does is catch touchdowns. He was let go by Ryan in 1989, however, due to off-field issues. Carter was signed by the Vikings and turned his life and career around becoming a two-time first team and one-time second team All-Pro and playing in eight consecutive Pro Bowls when they actually meant something. When he left the Vikings after 2001, he held most of the team's receiving records. He briefly played for the Dolphins in 2002, which was very forgettable, before retiring. Now, the Minnesota Vikings claimed the troubled wide receiver off of waivers on September 4th of 1990 for only the memorable number of $100. The best $100 that this franchise has ever spent, in my opinion. Absolutely. Now, stuck behind Hassan Jones and resident star receiver Anthony Carter, no relation, by the way, Carter didn't see very many passes come his way during his first season in Minnesota. He did gain a measure of revenge against his former team, however, catching six passes for 151 yards, including a 78-yard touchdown. In a Monday night contest at Philadelphia on October 15th, Carter, Carter finished the 1990 campaign with 27 receptions for 413 yards and three touchdowns. Now, in the following year, his sophomore year in Minnesota, so in 91, Carter stepped forward as a top pass catcher. He led the team with 72 receptions, 962 yards, and five touchdown catches. The winds of change were definitely blowing in Minnesota. After a second straight disappointing season, head coach Jerry Burns had retired. And then came in none other than Stanford head coach Dennis Green was named as his replacement on January 10th of 1992. And, became, and began a house cleaning process. The new sheriff in town released stalwarts like running back Herschel Walker and quarterback Way Wilson and traded defensive tackle Keith Millard to the Seahawks. 
The Vikings returned to NFL prominence in 1992, posting an 11-5 record and capturing their first NFC Central Division title since 1989 with Rich Gannon and Sean. And this is the year that I started watching Vikings play football, like when I really started catching on and watching this team play. So, with Rich Gannon and Sean Salisbury alternating at quarterback, Carter remained the team's primary aerial weapon, leading the team with 53 receptions, 681 yards, and six touchdowns, despite missing the final four games of the season with a broken collarbone. The Vikings season ended in disappointment, however, as the defending Super Bowl champions, I remember this, and it pissed me off, the Super, defending Super Bowl champion Washington Redskins upended them 24-7 in the wild card round of the playoffs that year. Now, moving on to 93. In 1993, veteran quarterback, I remember this too, Jim McMahon acted as the team's primary signal caller, and Carter had a huge breakout season. He posted career highs in receptions, 86 and yards, 1,071, while catching nine touchdowns, all team highs, and appearing in his first Pro Bowl. The Vikings finished the season 9-7, and seven, good enough for a playoff berth, but once again fell 17 to 10 to the New York Giants in the wild card round. Veteran quarterback Roar Moon joined the party in 1994 and immediately developed a rapport with Chris Carter. The veteran helped Carter set the NFL single season record for receptions with 122. The record was broken in 95 by Detroit's, honestly, probably one of the best receivers Detroit has had other than Calvin Johnson, Herman Moore. Yeah, you remember that name? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Chris Carter also led the team with 1,256 yards and seven receiving touchdowns, which earned him first-team All-Pro honors. Moon and Carter carried the team to a 10-6 record in the NFC Central title, but couldn't stop the Vikings from a third straight first-round playoff exit, a 35-18 home loss to the Chicago Bears. Carter teamed up with Moon again in 95 to post his finest statistical season. He got 122 passes for a career high, 1,371 yards, and then the NFL with 17 touchdown receptions. Carter received second team all pro honors for his efforts. The Vikings, however, finished 8-8 eight and eight and missed the playoffs for the, for the first time under head coach Dennis Green. Midway through the 1996 season, Brad Johnson took over at quarterback for the Vikings. And Carter did not miss a beat, catching 96 passes for 1,163 yards and 10 touchdowns. The Vikings returned to the playoffs with a 9-7 record, but were routed again by the Dallas Cowboys, 40-15 to in the wild card round. And that was a hell of a good Dallas Cowboys team. Carter appeared in his fourth straight Pro Bowl following that season. Carter continued to be the focal point of the Vikings offense in 97, and he was named to his fifth consecutive Pro Bowl leading the NFL with 13 touchdown receptions that year while pacing the team with 89 catches and 1,069 yards. Even though he had more impressive seasons statistically, 1997 may have been Carter's finest hour. As week after week, he dazzled with one spectacular catch after another. With Randall Cunningham at quarterback, he replaced the injured Johnson late in that season. The Vikings finally broke through in the playoffs, defeating the Giants 23-22 in a last-minute miracle comeback. The playoff success was fleeting, however, as the team fell to the 49ers 38-22 the following week. So, we're at the 1998 season. In 1998, the Vikings drafted Marshall wide receiver Randy Moss with the 21st pick in the first round. Suddenly, the Vikings possessed the NFL's most dangerous weapon. They cruised, the they cruised through the regular season, posting a 15-1 record while scoring a then-league record 556 points. Carter, who made the Pro Bowl for the fifth time, caught 78 passes for 1,011 yards and 12 touchdowns. Led by Moss, Carter, and Miller Lite Player of the Year, Randall Cunningham, the Vikings entered the playoffs as heavy favorites to reach the Super Bowl. They easily defeated the Arizona Cardinals 41-21 in the divisional round, advancing to the NFC Championship game for the first time since the 1987 season. 
The Vikings entered that game as 13 and a half point favorites over the Falcons. But and, that's lost, all, and that's all the further we need to go. We <laughs> but ended up losing 30 to 27 to become the biggest favorite to ever lose a home playoff game. I still remember that loss. And that's the first time that I really had a loss sting like that loss did in my experience watching sports. Um, that loss stung. It stings 24 years later. It still does. Yes. So, Carter had later said losing that game was the lone regret of his time in Minnesota and that he didn't even know if he wanted to play anymore afterwards. And I could, you know, I kind of felt that after that game as well. You know, would Carter still want to even play? Um, so, the following year, Carter had his finest individual season since 1995. The first team all pro caught 90 passes. For 1,241 yards and an NFL best 13 touchdowns, the Vikings easily defeated the Dallas Cowboys 27 to 10 in the wild card round and headed to St. Louis to face the NFL's newest, hottest offense. Minnesota led the eventual Super Bowl champion 17 to 14 at the half, but a second half flurry led to a 49 to 37 Rams win. I remember that. Mm hmm. Carter finished the decade of the 90s with 835 receptions, second only to Jerry Rice. Jerry Rice. Jerry Rice, excuse me, is 860 receptions and was named to the NFL's all-decade team. In 2000, led by newcomer Dante Culpepper, the Vikings won the NFC Central Division again, and Carter finished the season with 96 receptions, 1,274 yards, nine touchdowns, and the eighth Pro Bowl to add to his resume. On November 30th, Carter became the only, the second player in NFL history to reach the 1,000 reception plateau when he caught a four-yard touchdown pass against Detroit. The following season in 2001, the Vikings floundered with a record of 5-11, their first losing season since 1990. Carter's production dipped to its lowest point since 92, mostly because of quarterback's purging wins and effectiveness in the last three games. Horrible. You ever thought you've seen a horrible quarterback? Go watch some Spurgeon win highlights. There aren't any. So, 73 catches, 871 yards, and six touchdowns later, and a streak of eight straight pro, pro Bowls came to an end. Following the season, the longest tenured Viking exercised an out clause in his contract that ended his career in Minnesota. Yeah, we won't throw the Giants donut in there at all. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Carter left the Vikings as their all-time leader in, among other things, receptions, receiving yards, and touchdowns. Chris, in all due respect and honor, thank you for your time in Minnesota. I absolutely loved you as a player, and you're a decent, caring human being. I wish you the best, brother. Congratulations on your Hall of Fame induction as well. Yeah. All right, so with that, we've... Uh gone on probably a little bit longer than we expected this this week but uh that's really all we've got for this week uh again want to thank everybody for watching uh, if you have not subscribed to the channel yet please hit that little red subscribe button down below helped us out a ton we're getting closer and closer to that thousand subscriber goal we're up over 800 now uh thank you to everybody that's been subscribing during the season here uh again if anybody's interested we do have Limited supply of Vikings Uncensored merch available now. Just uh, drop us a line on, uh, send us an instant message off of our Facebook page. Probably be the easiest way to get a hold of us. Um, but with that, why don't you take us home, Lance? I'm going to keep this short and sweet this week because we are running on time here. Yep. Uh, Kirk, keep on doing what you're doing. Donatel, get your shit together. Let's go out. Let's whip Miami's ass. Come back next week. Give us something good to talk about. We'll see you next Friday, people. Skull. Have a good weekend, guys.